Bite of Courage is about you and me. It's about ordinary people aspiring to live their best, most authentic life by overcoming vulnerability and fear. It's about finding our courage and sharing our stories and discovering in the process that we're a lot more similar than we are dissimilar. Bite of Courage is about hope, about connecting with others, about choosing love over fear and having the courage to be who we're truly meant to be. Bite of Courage is about us. everyone. Welcome back to Bite of Courage. My guest today is Vince Arricchio, the founder of his own law firm, Arricchio Law Offices in Chicago. He provides a complete range of real estate services that facilitate residential and commercial real estate transactions. He's won high praise for his advocacy skills and his ability to provide results for his clients. Among these accolades, he was one of Illinois' top young real estate attorneys three years in a row, honors bestowed upon less than 2% of eligible lawyers, and was also named Illinois' rising star in business litigation by Chicago Magazine recently. He was also selected to the list of national trial lawyers, top 40 under 40 list, and has been called super lawyer and top lawyer by the global directory of who's who. He was also inducted into the National Association of Distinguished Counsel, which is awarded to the top 1% of lawyers. The team of lawyers and legal professionals that Vince leads is dedicated to achieving results for people as quickly and as efficiently as possible, but he also prides himself on being a Christian law firm. Vince says that we are all called to use our God-given gifts in the service of others. So as a lawyer, he puts his Christian beliefs into practice every day by treating all people with integrity, dignity, and respect. Welcome, Vince. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. I really loved reading the part on your website that you put your Christian beliefs into practice every day by treating all people with integrity, dignity, and respect, because I think regardless of profession, that's a great goal to aspire to. Before we get into that, can you give me your definition of courage? Sure. I've always looked at courage as not the absence of fear, but going forward regardless of and even in the face of fear. That's a great definition. Can you give me an example, maybe one you're in your personal life or professional life where you've had to sort of call upon that kind of courage? Sure. I think I have one from each, if that would be awesome. all right. From my personal life, my wife and I, we went through a challenge about five years ago with our daughter, who's now approaching 16, and we uh, received word that she uh, had a brain injury of sorts. It's worth saying, thankfully, that the uh, neurosurgeon said, on a scale of one to ten, this is just a one. Uh, <laughs> If that's any comfort at all. Uh, which, to the neurosurgeon, he thought we should have been overjoyed, you know. Um, How old was she? She, uh, she first had an incident around 9 or 10, and then two years later, there was a follow-up at 11. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my wife is uh, so strong. She's such a rock, day-to-day, -day, and in all she does... But I'm very thankful that in our marriage, uh, and, and this comes into play with how we approached my daughter, uh, that in marriage, when the real storms of life, when the real crises of life come, my wife has even told me that uh, she really appreciates that. That's when like, I can step in to be either compartmentalizing or, or dare I say, even stronger. I think my wife is strong 364 and a half days of the year. But, <laughs> but when there's the curveball, uh, she has made me understand, and, and I agree, that you know, I, it just, I just go into fixer mode, which is what guys or dads uh, do. But I can just, just re you know, respond rationally. And, and and put it into an order of let's get this done and my wife's like oh that that was great thank you for rising at that moment so you um, can be calm yeah yeah uh, I'm Italian 
I tend to be a bit emotional. My wife says, I, I, I'm very Italian, is her comment. But even my wife and daughter have said that they've never seen anyone be so calm in a crisis. Mm. It's like, uh, and I'm not equating to any stupid movies or anything, but everything slows down for me in a crisis. Everything becomes so clear. The, the good, the highs of life are my problem, not the problems. <laughs> yeah. So everything slows down and I answer and I know what to do. And I guess maybe that's helped me as a lawyer too, because every day, especially litigation, every day can be a battle against an opponent. But back to my daughter, the uh, incident occurred when, and when my wife and I were called to be courageous, the incident occurred when she uh, had some symptomology uh, after, of a, uh, after being collided into by a, a smaller child on the playground. Mm. And um, she, it was a Saturday, and the child, like, his head collided into her chin. That was the height. And she kind of got dizzy. We, did, we didn't think much of it. And two days later, uh, it was a Monday holiday, actually. So I was home. I come home, and my daughter was seeing hallucinations and talking about snakes and, you know, weird comments. So my wife was very concerned, but thankfully I was like, that's it. Let's scoop her up. We'll take her to the ER. So we ended up going to the ER, and she was diagnosed with a brain bleed. Uh, From the incident? At the well, the neurosurgeons aren't sure if it's, if it's congenital, if she was born with it, or if it was triggered from the uh, collision. In short, uh, and she's doing great now, just for you to know and for the audience, I presume. She's doing great. But the, the way the doctor described it was she had a weak brain vessel, not, not an artery. And the artery is a highway, and the vein, the vein or vessel is the off-ramp. So when you hear people have an arterial bleed, you can die because that's the highway. That's the main blood flow. But the vein is not as uh, severe, thankfully. He also described it as uh, the vein would bubble up like a raspberry and have weak spots. Mm -hmm. And then when one part of the vas raspberry bursts, it's a micro bleed. But then the blood in the skull cap irritates the brain, causing symptoms. Now, if there's any doctors out there, I could be 100% wrong, but that's how I remember the doctor explaining it to me. Mm -hmm. But it was an emergency. He said, oh, you know, you could schedule it in a couple of weeks. Take your time. Well, yeah. <laughs> Tell that yeah. to a parent. So we worked through with insurance, which is a whole other story. But the reason why it's not just this fact that called us to be courageous, it was that two-week period navigating those waters as a parent and not knowing if the outcome would be uh, where you'd leave the hospital one day with your own child. It was some, some tough, tough mental battles. So the best way to try to like put it into time and space, I used to take the uh, train. We lived in Chicago. I used to, I used to uh, take the train or bus in or walk sometimes. And I was walking past the Civic Opera house on a Wednesday, and the surgery was scheduled for the following Monday. And... Up until, uh, so we, I had known this about a week to a week and a half, and I would put on a brave face for my wife. I would not want, she needed me to be strong, but I was a wreck inside. It was all surface, uh, I was a fake. I was praying to, to Jesus. I was begging, not bargaining, not bartering, but, you know, praying for my daughter's health and if it would be his will that she would still be in our lives afterward, but having like no assurance or, or, or no really lacking in faith that it would work out. So I was walking down the street and my, I can't remember if it was Bella or my wife, my daughter, but one of them always wanted to go to the opera with the other and it had to be my wife. Uh, so I was walking by and I, I'm pretty sure it was Cinderella, not the Disney Cinderella, but an opera of Cinderella. And I know that because my daughter used to love the Cinderella princesses. And as I was walking by the opera house to my office, I had a thought, which was a morbid thought, which was, well, you know, always wanted to buy tickets for my daughter and my wife to go to the opera. So maybe I should pick this up now because this could be the last time they would ever do it because we don't know the outcome on Monday after the surgery because there was a risk that, sure. you know, the, the worst outcome possible. So I was mulling that over and I, I was about to walk to the ticket booth and I just stopped and I said, 
why am I being so pessimistic? Why am I assuming the worst? Why would I buy a ticket four days before impending death when there's no reason to believe from the doctors that one out of 10, uh, there's no reason to assume the worst. Why am I so dark and pessimistic? And not to be cheap, not to save money, but actually to defy the negativity, to defy the pessimism. I refuse to buy the ticket and I walked the rest of the way to my office praying to God, asking him to forgive me for doubt, for assuming the worst and doubting that my prayers could be answered. Hmm. Uh, it was like an act of defiance <laughs> it, to me. And it was, I, I didn't get a vision. I didn't have a dream. I didn't hear a voice that God said, your daughter's going to be okay. But it was a turning point, either spiritual or emotional in me to choose to believe the good as opposed to the bad, uh, to look on the bright side and not the dark side. And, um, and, and it took an, like a, an omission, not doing something as weird. And it was very backwards or weird, but applicable in a spiritual sense where just trust, trust in what is to come, have faith in the answer to prayer perhaps, but have faith in the, believing in the good and there's all those things you know you could just as much waste your time thinking negative thoughts as you can spend thinking positive thoughts and there's a psychological uh, psychosomatic uh, physical effect of that there's even an old church lady at one of the churches told me anxiety you can spend just as much time being anxiety and uh, being anxious and having anxiety as you can on prayer. But one is negative, one is positive. You might as well pray instead of being anxious and fearful. So from my personal, oh, and by the way, we went through the surgery and um, uh, the neurosurgeon said it was successful. And my daughter, to our knowledge, has made a full recovery and she's in uh, high school doing great. What do you think, Vince, in that moment, I almost, I feel compelled to say it was actually a walk with God from... <laughs> from the literally and figuratively, the a walk with God from the lyric was it the lyric? It was opera, a lyric opera house, house on um, um, Madison on Madison. Yeah. yeah, that there was something because this is what I'm trying to get to with this podcast. You know, there is a difference between bravery and courage. Courage, I think, is uh, the internal spiritual fight that we have. That warrior heart. There was something that clicked in you, that kicked in your courage is an act of defiance. Can you pinpoint in that walk, so to speak, what your process was? What were you thinking about that you said that you, it, to me, it comes down to awareness. How did you get to that place of awareness? There was something, was it that little voice inside? I, I, I can tell just from reading on your website, a, 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 which was so surprising to me. As a lawyer, you say on a website that, you know, this is a spiritually based uh, firm. Sure. Every marketing person has told me, don't do that. Uh, uh, from the day I got out of law school and I was in the Christian Legal Society as a student, from the day I got out of law school, uh, the the uh, career services says, don't put CLS, Christian Legal Society, on, a career on, killer. Your, on your resume. And I had to defy convention. I had to live out my truth. Courageously. The faith. Courageous yep. to say, you want to know what? I know I'm not under persecution. I know I'm not in China where there's, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ being, you know, imprisoned. I in no way mean any of that. But my one little stand coming out of law school was, oh my gosh, if I don't put Christian Legal Society on my resume, that's like textbook denying Christ. So I and couldn't you felt compromised. So I was like, well, can't do that. <laughs> so I put it on. Well, same thing with the website. So um, that's why I put it in there. And it was an act of defiance against uh, all better advice. And if I had a dollar, I wouldn't be rich, but if I had a dollar for every phone call my firm gets, that it's because of that sentence, uh, I'd be doing even better. Uh, people say, uh, we saw that you said, now you have to, and I'm a human, I fail, but you have to prove, you and your staff have to prove that you can live by, you know, so-called Christian principles, but that's why they call. It's courage to, yeah, it to put that forward. To answer your other question though, and, and I don't want to make this all about Christianity or religion, but 
Thank you for, uh, we didn't, I didn't even tell you that, so I, I take your leading as a sign. It was religious based. It was a spiritual moment. When I was in the middle of Wacker, along the break between the northbound and the southbound streets, I believe I heard a voice say, why do you doubt and think it's going to be bad? And that was the turning point. Either my own head or my own conscience or something else asked me a question mark. Why do you doubt and assume it's going to be bad? And I was like, why am I? <laughs> I've been praying for 10 days straight. Why am I doubting? And then it was like, well, fine, let's use the phrase, take the religion out of it. Why am I assuming it's going to be bad? You can spend just as much emotional energy assuming it's going to be good as assuming it's going to be bad. Mm -hmm. So whether people tend to take a religious approach or not, we have an emotional reservoir. And why spend our emotional reservoir on the negative when with an act of will, with self-control, uh, we're, uh, we're not just animals. We're, you know, I don't see dolphins you know, creating cathedrals. I don't see uh, the animal world creating the Mona Lisa. We're special. Yeah. There's something different. Or, or, well, we can reason. And we can reason and we have self-control and we can will and we can spend our time being courageous by focusing on the positive just as easily as focusing on the negative. So why not spend it on the positive? So th does that answer that yeah, question? Yeah. When you had that epiphany, you clearly found the courage inside of you to say, okay, I'm going to turn this into something positive. You also said that you're human. So we, we've, we have failings and we regress in some ways. After that moment, then a couple days later, you had the surgery. Well, those four days were interesting ones. Uh, so after that moment, it was a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So four days in between were surreal. In fact, my father flew in from out of town for the surgery to be there. And I said to him, Dad, it's fine. You don't have to come in. He goes, hey, I'm not coming in for your daughter. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? He goes, what will, I can't control that. What will be, will be. Whatever happens to your daughters in the hands of your doctors, I'm coming in for you. And I said, really? And he goes, well, yeah. He goes, uh, I'm there for you. And we were, but it was surreal. So, and then we had spiritual conversations, he and I. And what, what, there's two surreal aspects. One was in the physical world and one was in the mental. In the physical world, the day before the surgery, my dad's in town, and we're all at a park in Chicago. And my daughter's on the swings, on the seesaw, playing with her friends or the kids there. And it was like, you could call it the calm before the storm, but it, it was surreal. It was like, is tomorrow really going to be brain surgery? I mean, we're here at a park, and she looks fine. She looks like she doesn't have a care in the world. Uh, the doctor said she can still run. She can still play. I mean, it was weird. So it was like a slow motion four days to get to that Monday. Um, that was in the real world. In the mental aspect of it was, and, and I come at everything from a Christian worldview, and I'm not asking you or your audience to uh, agree to a Christian worldview. It's just the lens for how I interpret things, and I hope your audience and listeners use their lens for, for their higher power or their greater good or their Christ following. But my Christian worldview led me to a conclusion, and the reason why I brought up my father is we had deep discussions and he called me crazy, to the conclusion that whether my daughter lived or died was a win. And it was that as a young gal, 11 or 12, 11 year, years old, uh, she'd be going into heaven, she'd be going into the arms of my savior, and I'm living down here to get there. And yeah, I do believe we can have an early exit strategy. <laughs> I don't think that's right uh, to get there, but uh, every breath is in his hands. So I told my own father, I was like, if she survives this surgery and we have more time together, it's a gift. And if she precedes me to heaven uh, in the blink of an eye, I may have to wait, I have to wait, but I'll see her soon. 
and this incredible, what the Bible calls a supernatural peace came over me for those four days. I'm not throwing my wife under the bus, but, but she didn't have such a peace. <laughs> But for those four, she told me that. She was like, no, I don't have any of that. Uh, for, <laughs> for those four days, it, the surreal part is I felt like I was floating mm. without a care in the world about the coming. And it was weird to watch her run around because of like what was going on in her head. That's I, I don't want to be contradictory, but I said the earth and then the, and the mental. Mm -hmm. So for those four days, from the moment the Lyric Opera decision on Wednesday to the surgery, I felt what the Bible calls is the peace that passes all understanding. I felt that I was living that. I can't guarantee it. I'm not asking everyone to agree that it was true. I said I felt that I was living it. I felt that I was living what the Bible says is the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because how can a father who four days before surgery is fretting uh, for four days after that moment be at peace mm. and that was me and I thank the Lord Jesus for my worldview I thank the Lord Jesus for that one of the things that's so striking to me about that couple things with your dad coming out it reminds me of what Brene Brown says all the time is that courage is contagious the relationships that, that we have that matter the most to us that's where we find that inner strength that the contagious part of of courage, and so your dad coming out, I think, helped give you that courage. Probably helped your wife tremendously. For sure. For me, God comes to me through other people, through nature. Two things that I want to circle back on, and it was about your spiritual journey that you talked about earlier. Two things that happened. One was the call with your stepdad, that timely call. What was the second thing? Oh, sure. So, it's. In time and space, based on events that happened to me, as uh, I hope that I can demonstrate it, the shortest way of saying it is um, less than a year after that call from my stepdad, uh, I, I started like just picking up the Bible, uh, my stepdad quoting Psalm to me, uh, Psalm chapter 91 on my birthday, made me like, you know, wonder if I should be looking into this a little more. So for the next 11 or 12 months or so, I was reading the Bible here and there. My mom always said to me, there's uh, 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs in the Bible. Uh, there's a reason for that, son. Uh, one for each corresponding day of the month. Uh, on the first day of the calendar month, I'd read Proverbs chapter one. And it's all... It, my friends and you, it it's like, takes like five minutes, but there's pearls of wisdom in Proverbs. So I started reading the book of Proverbs over and over again, and it's called the Wisdom Book. Well, it's a little embarrassing, but my first job out of law school, I was told by my boss that um, in my first or second year of practice that I was a really good lawyer, but that I was you know, too distracted with uh, stuff going on in the office. And I fell in with a bad crowd. There were about, <laughs> <laughs> there were about 30 lawyers at their firm and there were like two or three uh they, they just happened to be ladies two or three female lawyers that they weren't happy there so uh i was friendly all above board but i was hanging out with the the disenchanted crowd uh the wine the the, the, the complaining crowd the and disgruntled the, the disgruntled employees so i fell into the wrong crowd and um shortly after my stepfather's call my boss comes in and he was a cursing man back then. It was the 90s, after all. Mm -hmm. But uh, And he was like, Vince, you got potential to be a really good lawyer, but you got to stay out of all this office politics excrement. Uh, and he used uh, a four-letter shorter <laughs> word. And he's like, and if you don't, it's going to, you know, I don't know how long you're going to be here. And he walked out of the office. This is my partner, my boss, the partner. I was an associate, young associate attorney. Again, second year of practice at most. He closed the door behind him. And I sat at my desk and I said to myself, I can't believe I'm like on the verge of being fired at my first job. You know, like what am I going to tell my fiance or at the time? And, and I'm like really depressed. But I was. I was hanging out with the disgruntled crew. And that was shortly after that call from my stepfather. Well, over the ne I started, I already said, I'm, I was in the book of Proverbs. And in the book of Proverbs, it says, you know, even a fool is considered wise when he holds his tongue. The Bible also says, um, you know, don't, don't uh, stop and stand or sit 
with uh, uh, with the wrong crowd, you know. So I started reading all these pearls of wisdom about, um, you know, w- just making wise choices. So a year goes by, and now I'm in Wheaton, Illinois, commuting from Chicago, reverse commute, as we know, because of the Wacker Drive story. An hour each day, I'm co- I'm getting into like road rage incidents on the, you know, compl- you know, people cutting you <laughs> off. I would come home in the evening, and my fiance would be like, "You're in such a bad mood. It's not just you're that that you're a lawyer, but it's your two hour commute each day, and you're, you know, all your friends are downtown, and you're driving the, the suburbs. There's nothing wrong. Wheaton's beautiful, but you know, there's nothing. <laughs> but you're, you, and I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm always angry and tense, and and um, and my wife's like, my fiance, who's now my wife's like, well, why, why can't they transfer you to the downtown office? They have an office on the South Street, and I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah, why don't they? <laughs> You know, and she's like, haven't you been asking? Well, and this is a part of the story. We had six partners at that firm and I had strategically planned every three months having like happenstance brush up alongside them conversations about being transferred downtown. Like, oh, is there, but if you rotate the partners enough, like you, you don't look like you're complaining, right. you know? So strategic planning. It was, and I would rotate and I would just, and so I would only run into them like every year and a half, you know, uh, bothering the same one. And they were like, no, there's no opening downtown. I was like, well, I'm doing reverse commute. They go, I know, Vince, but, you know, when you took the job out here in Wheaton out of law school, you knew that. That's why you got the geo prism. I'm like, you're right. I know, I know. It's just, you know, it's just so convenient to be right there downtown. I live downtown. So my fiance was upset. I was getting depressed. And then also, and this is no disrespect to my old law firm, but I was a very honest person and... It took a lot of long hours to get the timesheets in as a defense attorney. I used to do insurance defense, the defense side of personal injury. I did that for nine years. Um, but there at that firm, uh, people would be going home, other lawyers. I don't know how they did it. I didn't ask any questions, but I was there all hours because I was like by the book and they knew something I didn't know. Uh, but I was doing it honestly is all I'm going to say. And that was the other frustrating thing is just like long hours when it didn't look like everyone else had long hours. Now, you could argue I wasn't doing it right. You could argue I was a bad lawyer. But my actually my partner told me I wasn't that, I, you know, I had potential. So finally, like the following year, January, it was in the teens. I remember I, I, it was like January 14th or something because it was so pivotal. I remember this before my birthday. Uh, it was a Monday night. It was 8 o'clock at night in Wheaton. I still had an hour drive to get home. I looked at my timesheets to do things appropriately. I only had like seven and a half hours. I had been there like 12 hours. And because there's things you can't bill for. There's tasks as an attorney the insurance companies won't pay for. There's, uh, you know, there's bathroom breaks. There's lunch. You know, you, you just... And... It, People in the business know it usually takes like 10 or 11 hours to get eight real hours, you know, and that's why lawyers have long hours because they can't bill for everything, right. um, even if they're support staff. So I was really depressed and I couldn't take it anymore. It's eight o'clock at night. I'm going to get into road rage. I know my fiance's at home <laughs> waiting for, you know, for me to stop by. Uh, we had separate residences, but I would always stop by and say hi. Uh, she wanted to take walk at sunsets and I wasn't there. It was really frustrating. I looked at the timesheet. I only had seven and a half hours. I've been there 12 hours. I'm like, this, not that this job sucks. I'm like, this is a disaster. I must be like the worst lawyer ever. What a bad decision. And I was, and, and I had this thought. I was like, you know, I'm going to, pray but I was really depressed so I, I didn't want to I, I didn't know if anyone was going to see me because some people walk uh, late not everyone so I went into the men's room locked the door and I got on my knees no I didn't pray to the porcelain god okay but I got on my knees and I started bawling and I know it's embarrassing but I was like 28 29 mm-hmm. years old I started bawling and I'm like this is the worst decision I ever made coming to Wheaton I said, God, and this was the if, uh, I said, if you're there, won't you show up? I don't understand how I'm a guy from New York and I went to law school in Chicago and I'm in the suburbs of Wheaton, Illinois. I'm like, uh, uh, my girl, my fiance is in Chicago. My, all my friends are in Chicago. I was like, I don't know how I got here. I said, um, but I know one thing. I didn't include you in any decision since I was 15 years old. Mm. And, it, and I said, I don't even know if I believe you're there, God. But 
even though I was reading the Bible and Proverbs, it was like to me like a strong philosophy, you know, good, a good book. Mm -hmm. And I said, God, if you're even there, won't you show up? I apologize that I didn't ask you where to go to college. I apologize that I didn't ask you where to go to law school. I apologize that I didn't ask you if I should take this job in Wheaton. I've made a huge mess of my life. I've even asked these people to tr in prayer. I said this. I said, God, I even asked these people to transfer me downtown right where I live, and I can't get downtown. I don't know how much more I can take of this, but I said... And you could call this a bargain, but it was like a childlike prayer. It was a, a, a prayer from weakness, not if then that. It was just out of exasperation. I said, if you're there, won't you show up? And I said, and then I made a decision, not conditional. I said, I made a mess in my life. If you're there, you got to be able to do better. You want me to be a Wheaton, Illinois attorney? Fine. I will be the best Christian Wheaton, Illinois attorney I can come up I can be if you're there. Just show me if you're there. I was balling, I cleaned up, washed my face. I I didn't get my eight hours on the time. I just went home. I was so depressed, so I just left the time. So I was like, I'll make up the half hour. I was working seven days a week. I was like, I'll make up the half hour on the weekend. So that was a Monday night in January. I go home. Thursday that week, my boss, his name was Jim, the cursing guy. He comes in and he goes, this is a year later, by the way, he, after reading the Bible about Proverbs and keeping my tongue after, uh, that prayer three days before Jim slams the door and he goes, Vince, we got to talk. And I looked at him and in my mind, I was like, this is it. I'm getting fired. I've hung out with those girls. <laughs> I've blown it. What am I get? How am I going to get met? How am I going to get married if I'm unemployed? This is a disaster. And I said, yes, Jim. And he, and he talked in a rat-a-tat-tat fashion. He goes, Vince, me and the partners, we were at the partnership meeting on Tuesday night. And we decided you've been killing yourself on the Ike. We're going to transfer you to downtown. <laughs> when uh, he goes, uh, pack up your stuff. You're starting downtown on Monday. And, he, and I know that I must have looked like a, the Van Gogh painting of the screen <laughs> because my hands were gripping my desk. Jim jumps up totally misinterpreting my face and he goes Vince Vince you don't have to go downtown if you don't want to because I had just prayed that prayer I had just yeah. said I'd be the best Wheaton lawyer I could I could be as a Christian if you would just show me if you would show up and he goes you don't have to be downtown and I said Jim you have no idea how I want to be down how much I want to be downtown he goes good pack up your stuff you're there on Monday and he leaves and he slams the door and it was quiet in my office and I looked, yes, it was ceiling. And I looked up at the ceiling and I said, okay, you're there. I'm in. Aww. And from 1998 now to 2019, I've just been all in for Jesus since then. What a great story. What a testament. So, thank you. Uh, so I had a buddy, Steve, tell me once, and I don't believe this, but I would like to believe it, but my mind won't let me believe this. He, went, he He's also a Christian guy. Steve said to me, you know, Vince, I feel like God interacts with you differently than he does with a lot of other people. You have all these like time space occurrences. Uh, and I said, no, no, you know, God, God, God will, God will interact with everyone, uh, uh, where they're at. And he goes, yeah, but, uh, and, and the time does not permit all the ways in real life, you know, there's been events that lead me to understand that there's a God. But he goes, no, nah, no, nah, man. Um, he goes, I think it's because of your level of faith. I go, no, nope, no, I don't believe that I, uh, at all. And the one thing the Bible does say is that God is never more than an arm's length away from you. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's an arm's length is because it's your reach. That's right. And I always felt that I could reach for God. 
And I don't know why, but I felt that and believe that. So I do. And he shows up to the level of our reach. To the level we are willing to show up for ourselves. And absolutely, none of this absolves us of the daily grind, the uh, discipline of prayer, the humility of reaching out to him, of understanding. No, we haven't gotten into how this isn't a genie. This isn't easy. There's so much that we play a role in and do, which is why we have free will, the Bible says. But... uh, It takes courage to believe. It takes courage to have faith. It takes courage to believe there's a higher power. It takes courage to think that things are going to be better, not worse. It takes courage to believe that the Bible says all things happen for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Try telling that to, you know, a brain injury or or somebody going through things far worse than I've ever had to go through. So there's absolutely your part and you have to be courageous in your part. But God is saying, you have to lift up your arm to reach out, but God is saying he's there, was my point. Yeah, and I think that those little acts of courage, no matter how small or how trivial they may feel to someone, those it's those little acts of courage that are the spiritual building blocks for our faith. Faith casts that wide net over everything. And as we can reaffirm those things, uh, it gives us more and more courage. And like I was saying earlier, I think that that helps as we, you know, you put out what you want back. Yes. It raises our vibration in life and, and recalibrates our thoughts, which are followed by our actions. And, Absolutely. And you talked about that too, where it's with your kids, it's about what you're doing versus maybe what you're saying. Or battles, yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was heartwarming to hear that you actually could share the story about when you went into the bathroom and you're, you're bawling your eyes out. <laughs> it's hard to be vulnerable. You feel unprotected and unsafe. And Oh, yeah. Who knows how many clients I'm going to lose over that. But uh, and I, but it's but it's true. It's, it's uh, authentic me, not bragging, just I'm not going to be afraid. It's that, real. It, oh, yeah. Uh, and I'm a. I'm not going to blame it on being an emotional Italian. I mean, Italians are you know hot it's, cold. I'm emotional being. That's how. It, and I think there's some. My wife's half Polish, half Scottish. I think she's less emotional than me. I don't think it's racism to say that, you know, there's different cultures, different nationalities, or different comfort levels with expression of emotion. That's also and, one of the things yeah. I want to kind of prove on this podcast i'm having a, a little social experiment experiment in my own head with this but you know i'm convinced that we are more similar than we are dissimilar and what we share besides the struggle and the pain and suffering that is life to some degree we also share emotions we all feel the same emotions at different points to varying d- degrees on Absolutely. a scale of one to ten so how can I help you? How can you help others? How can you help me to help others to let people know that we are more similar, that we, you know, it doesn't matter that you, you are a lawyer per se. It matters who you are, what kind of person you are, what are you passing on to your children? And that to me sounds like it's more important to you. I mean, we need to work to live, to pay our bills. Yes. And, and financial freedom is, is nice as well when we have it, but we all know that it, there's truth, uh, a spiritual truth in the things that matter the most are the relationships that we have with people, with our families, with your stepdad, with your, you know, with your wife's parents and your kids and their friends, you know, so it really is about the relationships. And so how can we be of service to them? And that's how we started this podcast too. That is on your website. How can you be of service? We all have these gifts, God given gifts. How do we reach that potential to be of service to other people? I don't have anything to add to that statement. Well, that, that I was think perfect. you're. Yeah, I think you're a great example of that. If I if I need any legal services, I know who I'm going to. Oh, that's kind of. <laughs> I know who I'm going to be calling. Yeah. Let's move. I know we're short on time, but let's move into a quick round of rapid fire. Are you ready? We'll see. Favorite sound. The. I have two. Okay. Uh, the first is any child laughing. 
I will walk by a playground and I, I promise you, I, it is intoxicating. Yeah. So any child laughing. And the second, I don't know if anyone remembers the show, uh, What's Happening? <laughs> uh, but Dwayne yep. in What's Happening would go, hey, hey, hey. hey. <laughs> and that sound is one of the greatest things in my marriage because every time I do it, my wife cracks up. <laughs> So it's children... It's probably hard to for her to have an <laughs> argument with you then because all she have to do is say, hey, hey, hey. Oh, that every time I say it, uh, she know. laughs. Uh, so uh, a child's laugh and hey, hey, hey. I, I can't help it. It's true. Do you think of that every time you have an argument with your wife? Uh, you're killing me because <laughs> no, I, I, I well, never use it in an argument. I only use it when I'm saying hi. Okay, or, or, Mr. Lawyer, yeah. a little advice for you. Hey, hey, hey. I am going to take your counsel. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll bill you later. <laughs> Worst feeling in the world? Uh, that is really not easy. Um, Just got to get over this, but you know, just disappointing anyone. Um, I, I am not perfect. So I don't claim to be perfect. So if I've ever disappointed anyone, uh, it just bums me out. Oh, I forgive you. Yeah. I absolve you. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite word? I know what my favorite... I, I, I knew this was coming. I'm going to bum you out and answer a different question. I know what my favorite word's supposed to be, and it's love. L-O-V-E. <laughs> and I swear, and, and I... When I think about Christian love and, and the, what the Bible says about love, it just, uh, I fixate on it because I'm trying to learn what it means. And no, this isn't a professional uh, thought. This is like a person, you know, take off my lawyer hat just as, a, as a, a person walking in life. Like, what is it to love my neighbor? What is it to really love? That, that word, right, I'm fixated on that word. It's confounding me right now. Mm. What is it to love? And I, I'll, uh, this isn't a joke. Of course, I'm faithful to my wife. You know, of course, uh, you know, I care about my kids. I don't mean that. I mean, what is it to love thy neighbor or your enemy? Well, that's how you can learn to love probably the best. Start with your enemies. Yes. Your least favorite word. Not guilty. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> It's, I know I'll it's two you, words. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you some leeway there. Give me a there. pass? Okay. Yeah. Favorite quality in a friend? Uh, how about that they just pick up the phone if you call? Hmm. Nobody answers the phone anymore. And I'm sure I'm guilty of it. You know, they say we always see the faults in others that are, are our own. Oh, sure. So I can't stand it when nobody picks up your yeah. call and then there are people that love just to text but if you're a friend and you know somebody's a caller come on so picking up the Pick phone up the phone yeah it's nice well then least favorite quality someone who doesn't pick up the phone no nah, yeah that's a good i'll take that that's fine well, i shouldn't i sh shouldn't speak for but my it, client <laughs> <laughs> but it's true um yeah well on top of that i I mean, nothing special. What what bothers everyone? You know, a lie. Mm -hmm. You know, well, favorite lie. quality in yourself. I hope this can be proven true, but I am empathetic. Aww. It's a gift and a curse because if you care too much, you mm -hmm. feel pain a lot. But but that's why I was doing personal injury law. That's why I like working with real estate uh, buyers who are brand new buyers. And in my business, real estate lawyers hate, sorry, in my business, it's not preferred to work with first-time buyers. There's a lot of hand-holding. Uh, it's more work for the same flat fee in mm -hmm. Illinois. Uh, but I love working uh, with first-time buyers because there's such, uh, for many reasons, there's uh, uh, this isn't a plug, but you know, like there's the newness, the excitement. They're beginning their lives. If there's kids involved, I mean, it's, yeah. it, the thing that makes me the least money makes me the happiest. It's helping new buyers, but I can feel what they're going through. And I also used to like doing personal injury law, law to help people feel because uh, I could relate to them. I wanted to help them. Yeah, making that connection. Mm -hmm. So being empathetic. Yeah. I used to say I, used, I mistakenly I mistakenly would say empathic 
but, but I can't read mine, so that's not true. <laughs> So I don't know how many years I was like, well, you know, I'm very empathic. And then somebody comes to me and go, dude, you got to drop that. Yeah. You know? You're fired. You can't, fi- you can't read mine. That's yeah. funny. How would you live your life differently if you knew no one would judge you? Uh, d- does no one would judge me mean they would support the decision? I, I, I want to make sure I answer this question correctly. I was thinking in terms of someone being critical. Like someone made fun of you or made you feel less uh, or humiliated or embarrassed you or they were laughing at you, uh, n- laughing at you, not laughing with you. So, oh, my gosh, you're talking to the wrong guy. Everyone laughs at and with me sometimes. But as my wife says, I'm wrong. It's always at me. So, <laughs> uh, so no, I, I can't I, I'm having a tough one with that because I, I think I'm pretty authentic so I'm blanking but when you said no one would judge me the reason I'll, I'll just front it the reason why I said well would that mean without judging they'd be supportive like not critical but supportive I'd quit being a lawyer and become a pastor mm. but I don't think that's something that is, is realistic at the is moment realistic yeah yeah but if no one would judge me you know I'd, I'd and not you know, and, and not care about you know. Oof, heck, I'm probably going to get calls if anyone that knows me listens to this. And they're like, "What's wrong with you?" You know. But uh, no, if, if 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 it didn't bother anyone and and it didn't matter, I would just. I love being a lawyer, but you know, I always thought that it would be great to be a pastor too. Most influential person in your life today. There's so many, so many, but. I, it's my wife, and, and I'm not trying to get brownie points. I think that my wife is one of the most solid, uh, supportive uh, people. Of course, you know, your parents and things like that. But you, at this moment, my wife is really rock solid, and I'd have to say most influential in my life. That's pretty awesome. How long have you been married? 19 years tomorrow. Oh, Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Is there anything that you are dreaming about doing in your life that you'd love to bring to the world that you need the courage to do it? So not disagreeing with the pastor idea, but uh, I always thought it would have been amazing to oversee a charitable foundation. Mm. I wanted that. I uh, I don't think that's uh, the path I'm on, but I always wished or dreamed that I was given a platform on a large scale. I, I hope, I, I hope uh, that it's not pride, but I think, I think it's from a belief that, you know, to help people on a wide scale, it would be awesome, like, uh, to be just the a board member of a foundation, a charitable foundation, or, or if God gifted me with some large sum of money to do good in the world. Um, I, I always wanted that. Uh, I read John D. Rockefeller. I love biographies. I've read a ton of biographies and I fell prey early in my uh, 20s to the phrase, uh, if you want to be, sorry, this is, it sounds one gender, but it was said, you know, decades ago. Uh, If you want to be great, read about great men. Uh, I would modify that to today's world is great men or women. Uh, but I love biographies and I read biographies and I know a lot, of, you know, you read one biography on John D. Rockefeller. Uh, he was a super charitable Christian. You read another biography about John D. Rockefeller. He was this ruthless oil man. Now we're very complicated. It might've been, he might've been different things at different decades. Uh, but when I read about all that he did, I mean, and with his fortune and on what scale, it was really amazing. What would be the charitable foundation that you would want to get involved in? I love kids, always loved kids. I actually went to the Peabody School for Teachers before law school. I thought about being a a kindergarten teacher. Uh, And I've been, uh, just to prove my street cred with kids, uh, 
Uh, I volunteered as a, a Cub Scout master. Loved being with kids. I would always do those parent uh, teacher things in my kids' school. I was uh, president of the PTO in Chicago for a number of years, which I realized that was a lot of administration didn't have much to do with kids, but uh, I did that for the kids. So I. I'm overwhelmed with uh, the smiles, laughs of kids. I always thought it would be great. Oh, and sorry, uh, by the way, I'm currently uh, involved in Chicago with uh, a, a, a group um, with uh, underprivileged uh, inner city kids, they, and I uh, work with them. I was for nine years with Partners in Education, where I mentored the same kid from second, wow. from sec- seven years, from second through ninth grade. And he's now 27, and I'm helping him out with the legal matter. We stay in touch. Uh, so I love kids because I see that, you know, what happens in childhood matters to form them as a human being. So it would be something with it. You can't have a charity for rich kids, so it would have to be underprivileged yeah. children. Something so I do with working kids. with kids because there's, for me, there's something about working with people that have are as close to having a beginner's mind as you can get agreed and by the way i disagree with one of my buddies who teased me he didn't mean it in a bad way but he's like yeah you you, you like you know volunteering with kids because you know you're in charge you can, they can't talk back and i'm like oh really uh but i i thought about that like why don't i want to work with elderly people is that true or how come i don't work with people my own age as a middle-aged person well no i mean i'm in the business field uh, i help people all the time who are adults but I, I, it's just the, the innocence in children before the world hits them. Mm -hmm. I would, I just love playing an impact in bringing some smiles and happiness to their world at that time. Yeah. It's very rewarding. All right. Last two questions. What is your favorite time of day? 3 p.m. (laughs) <laughs> okay, well, I'm not going to let that hang. Why 3 p.m.? Oh, I didn't know if that was the end of the... It's the end. So, in New York City public school, the class bell would ring at 3 p.m. And I was well into my late 20s. I was in the workforce a few years. And I remember looking at the clock. Uh, I, I noticed that I was always happy at 3 p.m. when I looked at the clock. I was still at my desk. I was still working. And I was like, why am I always happy at 3? And one day I sat down and meditated on it, and it hit me. When I was a kid, the 3 o'clock bell would go off. That's when I got to go outside and play with my friends right after school. So I'm now in my late 40s, and it never went away. I love 3 p.m. Something from th- before. And now, dinner is the end, like like 6 or when it gets dark. But th- that 3 to 5.30 window, I feel like a million bucks. <laughs> Strange as that may sound. I'm only registering shock, but I, I have to tell you that my shock is because 3 p.m. was the absolute worst time of day. Ooh. And for me, 3 p.m. every day, uh, I dreaded going home. I'm, I'm so, impacted by that. I, I'm in a, I was about to say I'm sorry to hear that. I, I, I stopped myself. I'm, I'm, I'm going to think on that, and, and I'm impacted by and that. And I recently have uh, discovered that a lot of... One might call it PTSD. I hate to give labels to things, but uh, from the time I have lived in this area, I recognize that every day, first it was at 2.15 and then it was after 3 o'clock, every time I would hear the bus come around the neighborhood, dread would set in, just a sinking, sinking feeling. One should be very happy knowing that their kids are going to be on that bus, but what I was hearing was the engine of the bus, which I still hear every day if I'm at home. Now I'm more aware, so it's gotten better, but uh, the physiological triggers, the panic attacks, the the sweating, my my palms sweating, my heart racing, it kicked in every day at 2 and then every day at 3, 
because when that bell went off in school when I was growing up, that meant I had to go home and I didn't want to go home. So here I am 30 years later, still feeling the physical or the physiological effects of that. So I'm sorry to digress. I just, it's, not, it's not a digression. How about this? Um, my faith tells me that you can receive absolute healing from that through prayer. I believe in this world, not just the next. I believe in that this world, you can be free of that through prayer. That's what I've been using to get through it and talking to people, you know. Um, yes. But now that I have become fully aware of where that source is, the, the root of where that came from, the root of how I learned it and who I learned it from, uh, and accepting that, I have made great strides, but it comes from awareness and acceptance and then ultimately forgiveness to move on. I agree. Which goes right back to what you said earlier about, you know, having the living each day takes courage. So yes, there's a good one for you to meditate on for me. So glad I asked you about your favorite time of day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, last question. What do you want to be remembered for? Well, there's, you know, there, there, there's the physical realm and then the spiritual realm. So uh, in, in my worldview, so I automatically think spiritually when you brought that. My mind automatically thought spiritually when you asked that question. There's a uh, Bible verse that says uh, that every Christian should seek to heal, to hear from God when he sees him. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So my spiritual dream and desire and answer is I hope to be remembered by my Lord and Savior to hear well done. My uh, physical realm, because we're all still down here and we're still walking through time and space, um, my physical answer is not, not as clear. That That is a really good question. Um, I, 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 it ties into the difficulty of learning what the word love means. I, I, I would love to be remembered for uh, loving my neighbor as myself. And I know these are all preachy phrases. I'm sorry, but I'm just here to be transparent. If I could be remembered for loving my neighbor as I have loved myself, caring for people, uh, I, th I think that would dovetail into a job well done. It's a great answer, and it ties nicely into what you do for a living. Well, like I said, I'm not, a, I'm not you know, a criminal attorney. I'm a... Uh, uh, both the real estate and some remaining personal injury, just trying to help people. And that's why I went to law school originally. That's awesome. Well, thanks for being here, Vince. I appreciate your the courage it took to... I know it was tough getting you nailed down. I know you've been really busy, but I really appreciate you taking the time to come in and talk today. Well, thank you for having me. So for anyone wanting more information about Vince or if you need any legal advice or consultation, you can find more information on that at reallawchicago.com. I'll also have that information up on my website at biteofcourage.com after the show. Until next time, be bold. Be brave, be daring, and take a bite of courage. See you next week. Thanks, everyone, for tuning into my podcast, Bite of Courage. To learn more about my guests, you can go to biteofcourage.com or go to my website, humormewithmo.com, where I also post weekly articles about finding humor in life's absurdities. Until next time, be bold. Be daring, be brave, and take a bite of courage. This is a trio production, all rights reserved.